your rehearsal works great for accountability for tuning because everybody's in the room and you can hear everybody and they can hear everybody and you can hold everybody accountable to having that quality tuning standard. But what happens when they go home? What sort of accountability measures can we put into place to make sure that they're obtaining quality tuning at home and held to a certain type of standard? Our instruments have four strings, hopefully. In some cases, we have three and you, know, you tell them, hey, you need to get a new string or whatever, go to the shop and get that taken care of. It's a rental, but you know, most of them have four. Occasionally we have a five-stringed instrument, uh, but uh, let's just say four strings. And we can use those strings as guide markers to tune notes that line up with those strings at home. So on, on the cello, you know, every single fourth finger note can be played with an open string um, to the string below except for on the sieve string, of course, and we can find lots of notes where it matches an open string. On violin and viola in first position, we have our third finger notes that should match the lower octave on the lowest string, unless it's on the G string or C string for violin and viola, respectively. And we also have fourth finger notes that we can tune with the upper strings. And if you've taught your students how to hear the beats, or the amplitude modulation from sound waves canceling against each other. When you're playing these double stops at home practicing, you should be able to hear the beats and the sound if it's out of tune, and you can make those beats go away. So again, the students are hearing the adjustment and they're spending just a little bit of their individual practice time calibrating the ear so that they adjust to something that's in tune and hopefully the rest of their practice session will go better. I don't think we spend enough time telling our students how to practice. You know, we just say, hey, learn this, hey, go practice this, hey, we need to work on this, but we don't really tell them how. And a lot of students, they go and they fill out their practice cards, yeah, I practiced 30 minutes today, and they just went home and they just did run-throughs of their concert music, but they accomplished nothing in that process. So we can give students tasks to do at home. Hey, practice this way, do this exercise, do this two minutes, set a timer, do this for two minutes. You know, line up your fourth fingers for two minutes, just do it. And it's going to make a world of difference when it comes to calibrating the ear, and it's going to keep them engaged at home too, so that they're maintaining a, a quality of standard for themselves. A lot of times we can use our natural harmonics in order to find notes that we can match and we can use as reference points to play in tune. So if your students are advanced enough to find these harmonics, uh, and if we're learning something in the upper positions, sometimes we can use these harmonics again to calibrate the ear and every once in a while just stop and check and make sure we're still in the ballpark of something that's in tune. If you're playing on a quality instrument, your instrument should produce advanced sympathetic vibrations. I refer to these as ringtones. Ringtones come from the four open strings, so make sure that you're tunneling with your fingers if you're covering just even a little bit of the open strings, sometimes that damages the ringtones. But the entire construction of the instrument should be designed around that resonance and that amplification of these advanced sympathetic vibrations. Really high quality instruments, if you've ever had the opportunity to play on something extremely high quality, you'll notice that it can ring all day, generally. And I say generally because some instruments that are very expensive are that way because of its historical importance, not necessarily its playing value. And there's, uh, there's great reasons to buy um, something for its historical importance or, or for something for its musical value. I'm, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but as far as ringtones are concerned, you know, the, the channeling inside the instrument, you know, as we go around and how, where, where the graduation of the wood is, what type of wood is used, just all the care that went into making that instrument is all designed to bring out those advanced sympathetic vibrations or ringtones in the instrument. So can you get your students to hear every time they play a ringtone? Can you get to have them lift off the bow and hear if it's ringing or not? If they can hear that ring, or if even if they can hear the ring when they're playing, you know, they hear those advanced sympathetic vibrations blending with their resonant sound, with, with the fundamental sound with their finger, then you've, you've really won a tuning battle there and a calibration battle. So again, this is something you could teach them in the classroom, how to play a fingered note, that happens to be a ringtone and have them hear if they can hear the ring you can go down the row and you can make it into a game and everybody can try to make that ringing sound. Students can also have a pitch pipe or something you know most uh, phones and computers you can download an app that has some sort of a drone and they can play whatever passage they're playing around a specific tone. 
Now for this, you might want to give them the tone to play because it does make a difference. So not every passage of everything in a, in, a, in a piece that's in the key of D major is going to sound best with the D against it. You know, what if it's surrounded by dominant harmonies and you need an A? So you might want to give them a clue as to what drone they should be playing with whatever passage they're practicing so that they can use that drone to help calibrate the ear and help preserve that quality of pitch and provide accountability for their intonation at home. And this is going to take intentional practicing, not just mindless noodling. They're gonna have to really listen to that drone and really evaluate, is this in tune? And if they're not doing that, it's not really practicing. It doesn't count for anything. And this is again why the technique hierarchy is so important, is because those values need to be set up so the students know the difference between intentional practicing and noodling. There are also programs out there like Smart Music and Music First, and a lot of them um, have tuners built into them and they can show you where it's in tune and where it's out of tune and give some advice. I found that not all of the advice that this software gives is 100% accurate. Sometimes it says we're in tune and we're not, and sometimes it says we're out of tune, and if there's any background noise at all, it really can mess up you know, the, its evaluation of your pitch and rhythm. It also does not evaluate tone whatsoever, and tone is foundational for tuning. But it's there, and it's a guide, and it's better than nothing, and a lot of the, these programs have background tracks that you can either program, or some of them are pre-programmed in. They can play along with something else, which makes a whole lot more fun, and it also helps to calibrate the ear if they're practicing intentionally. Hopefully your students can find a method that you can teach them, we can all agree upon, hey, this is fun, this is worth doing at home, that they can do a little bit every day so that their practicing becomes intentional and they can continue to make incremental progress every single day, just 1% better every single day. Again, tuning is important, but we have to establish tone first and we gotta talk about those values and make sure our students are set up with good values or else this is all for nothing. So don't forget about the values hierarchy and make sure that you tackle tone and values first.